Let's talk about islands. It may surprise you to know that in the last 500 years since such statistics were being kept, the overwhelming majority of all plant and animal species extinctions have occurred on islands. It may also surprise you to know that in the United States, Hawaii, our only island state, which occupies two-tenths of 1% of the U.S. landmass, has in our history been home to 72% of all our plant and animal extinctions. And it will certainly surprise you to know that Lord Howe Island, a small island in the Coral Sea between Australia and New Zealand, in the last 500 years since statistics were kept, it has had more bird species and subspecies extinctions than Africa, Asia, and Europe combined. Hearing those statistics, it should not surprise you that a prominent biologist from the Smithsonian Institution has said that this unprecedented rate of species extinctions on islands is one of the swiftest and most profound biological catastrophes in the history of the Earth. Now think of that, one of the most swiftest and most profound biological catastrophes in the history of the Earth is happening right in front of our eyes right now and very few people know about it. In fact, I'd wager if we all went outside on the street and stopped the first hundred people who walked by and said, where are species extinctions happening? A few would say the Amazon, a few would say the Congo, and my bet would be out of a hundred, none would say islands. But all is not bad news. I want to tell you right now about a very simple and very important and very clever innovation that is letting us help combat this crisis. The picture there is Dr. Paul Cox, a prominent botanist. And he was 20-something years ago in the remote village of Falialupo, Samoa, studying the flora of that very large 30,000 first growth, 30,000 acre pristine rainforest. And when he was there, the earth moving equipment came in to cut down this forest. And this is an actual picture from Falialupo at the time. And Paul went to the chiefs and said, what's going on? And they explained to him that the government of Samoa told them that if they didn't build a better school, because it was just a ramshackle hut, the teachers would be removed and there'd be no education for their kids. Now, it doesn't matter what kind of culture you're from. It doesn't matter uh, what kind of language you speak. Everybody wants their kids to have a better education and have a better quality of life. So they thought and thought, how can they raise the money to build this school? Falialupo, like most island villages, is on a barter economy, so their per capita annual income was less than 100 US dollars per year. So there's no way it was gonna happen. So to their chagrin, they just said, okay, we'll sell the logging rights to our rainforest. We don't wanna do it, but our kids need to be educated. So Paul Cox on the spot said, well, how about if we raise the money to build the school, would you then uh, kick the loggers out and sign an agreement to save the rainforest for 50 years? And they said, of course. Well, it turns out Paul was bluffing. There was no we. So right on the spot, Seekology, an NGO, was formed, raised the money, built the school that you see, and the 30,000-acre rainforest is preserved in perpetuity. And that's a current picture of something that would have been a wasteland without this little agreement. So there uh, at the spot was a very simple and cost-effective and clever innovation. Uh, trade off something an island village needs and wants and can't otherwise afford in exchange for an agreement by the villagers to uh, establish a forest or marine reserve. Now, this very uh, clever idea has led to similar projects by Seacology around the world, and I want to take you on a quick around-the-world tour. And our first stop is Fiji. And here in the village of Nisinga Singa, Fiji, when, when we go to uh, meet with the village leaders, we're always greeted in Fiji with a kava ceremony. And that's what you're seeing in that picture. And for those who don't know it, kava is the ground-up root of a pepper plant that has mildly narcotic properties. And a lot of people, yes, and a lot of people say it's an acquired taste, and if so, it's a taste I have acquired. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, after that, the villagers usually entertain us with whatever the true form of dancing is, not some tourist thingamajig that you might see at some high-rise hotel. Nasinga Singa is an inland village, so it's, spear, uh, it's a spear dance to show how they hunt the, the wild game, the wild pigs and all that. Now, if there are any kids in this audience, I ask them to cover their eyes for the next picture because this next dancer is particularly scary. And I judge by the laughter, you recognize that that is me. <laughs> and it was really an interesting experience because as the dancers with the spears went left, I went right. As they went up, I went down. I had spears in my nose, spears in my bum, whatever. <laughs> but why did I do this? Do I like making a fool of myself? Not so much. Uh, but I did it because when we work with indigenous villagers, it is critical that we respect them and treat them as equals. And we are not the people there just sitting behind and letting them entertain us. If the chief asked me to dance, I'm going to dance. Now, why were we in a Singa Singa? We were there because they tr we traded a forest reserve for a water system, which uh, enabled the women not to have to walk hours each day to the one river and hours each day back. So we had huge uh, water cisterns. And they also asked for the first ever environmentally appropriate flush toilets. And again, uh, one of our hallmarks is we always listen to what the villagers say they want. We don't sit in an office in the US saying, here's what you should have. That sounds pretty obvious. It's very unusual. But what was uh, not obvious to me is during this t uh, visit, they were so proud of these toilets that they took us on a toilet tour. And what you see behind me is the first toilet. Uh, you can see it's all garlanded in flowers. And I was there with a board member, Jake Walker, and they asked me to cut the ribbon. And I cut the ribbon to, to uh, open the toilet. And the whole village was just as close as you are to me right now. And then the chief comes up to me, would you do us the great honor of inaugurating <laughs> the toilet? <laughs> so I took another one for the team. <laughs> and when I finished my business, and flushed the toilet, I got a great round of applause. <laughs> now, I must say that I am uh, uh, in my 50s right now, and sometimes, and uh, those others in, in the same age group will recognize this, when I successfully pee in the middle of the night, I give myself a round of applause. <laughs> but this is the first time I've had another audience applaud that same thing. <laughs> Moving on now to the Cook Islands. The Cook Islands are another island nation in the South Pacific. And there, the village of Muri approached us. This is on Rorotonga, the main island, very beautiful island. And they said, we really need a community center to be renovated. It was dilapidated, et cetera, et cetera. And so we gave them money to do that. Uh, by the way, on these projects, it's all volunteer labor, not primarily to save money, because when people build these things themselves, it's theirs. It's not some gift, so they take care of it in the long term. Anyway. With the local wisdom, not only did they renovate it, but they had the very clever idea, which you can't see in this picture, on the far side of the building, far left, they put the only uh, purified water with access outside for no cost on the island, thinking the villagers would, li would like that. Well, not only did the villagers like it, it is now the water source for the entire island, just something that we never would have thought of, but that's what they did, very clever. And uh, so... Uh, that's what they did, and I was there to visit this project several months ago, and the next day, I was just walking down Murray Beach, and I saw this sign, which really did my heart good, because this wasn't part of some tour or whatever. These are the signs they had constructed that I stumbled across it, introducing a very old Polynesian tradition uh, in the Cook Islands called Rao Ui, which means no take marine reserve, really. So they thought of it long before Westerners did. And uh, here is the reserve itself. And the question I have for you all, is that worth saving for a $30,000 community center? OK, now we're going to the Maldives and the Andaman Islands. The Maldives are fairly much south of India. And the Maldives, uh, every species of turtle in the Maldives is endangered. And the Maldivian government was very clever. They passed a law that said you cannot take, you cannot kill turtles. But like laws all over the world, there was always a loophole. The loophole here was they forgot to say, you can't harvest turtle eggs. So we approached the village and said, is there something that you, you would need in exchange for banning the harvesting of turtle eggs? 
and they say we desperately needed a kindergarten and that's what we gave them the money to do. You could see the official opening there. The kindergarten is right behind the kids and it was built so well that uh, you all sadly remember, I'm sure, the 2004 uh, great uh, tsunami of Southeast Asia. At one point in time, every square meter of the Maldives was, uh, was underwater during that event. And the water came in, you can't quite see it, about 10, 15 meters behind that school. It was built so well that the only damage it suffered were warp doors and the copy machine got, uh, got ruined. But, uh, and uh, the ban on, on sea turtle harvest is not only st uh, sticking, it's spreading to other uh, islands in the Maldives. Here we are in the Andaman Islands. They are in the uh, Andaman Sea between India and Thailand, and they are a possession, if you will, of India. And there, very interesting, it was their idea, not ours. They said that they wanted uh, money to construct an environmental education center in exchange for a 2,000-plus acre no-take marine reserve, and that we were more than happy to do that. And one of the things I love about this way of this barter system we're using here is the results are so tangible. So there is the education center. There are kids being educated. And there is a, um, a leatherback turtle. You've seen one picture earlier today of that. This is not photoshopped. They are the world's largest and I believe most endangered turtle species. Why I love that picture is there's always skeptics. Do marine reserves work? Do they work? Whatever. And you'll always find doubters. Uh, this is just a little bit of anecdotal evidence. Leatherback turtles had not laid their eggs on that beach. This is the beach that was uh, under the reserve uh, clause for 20 years. And a year after the reserve started, the leatherbacks had, uh, started coming back and laying eggs and have continued to do so. Possibly a coincidence? I doubt it. Okay, now speaking of big things on the beach, this is an elephant, and it's Mahout, or trainer. And the crazy person in the water is, you guessed it, me. What was I doing in the water then? Well, I got a great piece of travel advice from a local person. He said, when you see the elephant coming down the beach for a swim, get in the water first. And I said, why? I, I don't get it. He said, elephant's natural reaction when it goes into water is to defecate. And if you're behind it and the waves are coming in, you're going to have a cannonball of dung right in your face. <laughs> the best piece of travel advice I ever got, by the way, I did, uh, uh, the, why I was out there was I got to snorkel with an elephant, which was kind of unusual. We've seen a, a, a what was it, a surfing elephant. This is a snorkeling elephant. Uh, okay, now we're at the Philippines. The Philippines has the distinction, you may not know this, of having the most coral reefs of any country in the world. It also has the dubious distinction of having the most destroyed coral reefs of any country in the world, largely either through cyanide fishing or blast fishing. And once the blasts occur in blast fishing, the coral is broken to smithereens and it will not grow back unless it has something solid to latch onto. So uh, we heard of this technology, this eco-reef modules, which for those who snorkel or surf, uh, snorkel or dive, would see that they mimic um, a staghorn coral. And they're made of porcelain intentionally so that within 30 years they will disintegrate, so there won't be any ugly artificial thing out in the water. And uh, as I said, we like to have the local people work on the projects. They don't know how to dive in, on the Palawan Island where this was, but they did help assemble the uh, structures and transport them. And since they couldn't do it, see, uh, we like to get our hands, I was going to say dirty, our hands wet, and we're the ones who actually install that system, and the results are remarkable. It's not that a coral reef is going to come back the next day, but there's tremendous growth. You wouldn't see any of that white if you were diving or snorkeling that right now. It's all covered with growth. Okay, here we go, speaking of diving and all that, to uh, the Red Sea. And uh, the Red Sea is the most popular dive spot in the world because of its proximity to Europe. And part of the problem of being loved so much is that with all the dive boats going there, they throw their anchor overboard and take out a huge swath of coral. Most people think if an anchor goes over, it's just going to destroy the little diameter of the anchor. But no, the boat shifts and all that. It's amazing how much uh, coral uh, uh, an anchor will take out, particularly boats staying overnight. So this organization in Lower Egypt, Southern Egypt, asked us for funds for, uh, for uh, mooring bowies so the boats could tie up and they wouldn't have to do it. And we not only gave the funds, we actually helped install the, uh, the modules as well. 
And here we are in Isla Mujeres, which is off the east coast of Mexico. And uh, that is, of course, a whale shark, the world's largest uh, fish. Until about 15 years ago, many marine biologists thought they were fairly s uh, solitary uh, animals. But it turns out that's not true. They do aggregate. And it also turns out the world's largest aggregation of whale sharks is right here in Isla Mujeres, right off of that. And uh, believe it or not, they can be hundreds at one time. And I know this from firsthand experience because two years ago, I was swimming in the middle of 350 whale sharks. And that's the number I counted just from the fins itself. And it's a very interesting experience doing that because you're snorkeling, you're staying on the surface looking for that. And they're filter feeders, so some of them are about three or four feet below the surface. You can't see any evidence of them. And they're so friendly or so unbothered by human beings, they just bump, bump right into you, which is quite startling, quite startling indeed. So what would... Uh, so the problem is they're too friendly. And here, here you could see quite a few if you look closely whale sharks. But you can also see the problem. The whale shark aggregation is on the cargo line, main cargo shipping line between Texas and Mexico. So what uh, what's happens with the cargo ships and just smaller craft as well, that the whale sharks are being decimated slowly but surely. So we are in the process of installing a uh, uh, demarcation buoy, which will actually radio broadcast and have visible markers saying, whale sharks, slow down. Uh, last project I'm going to show you in our tour is in Kenya on Funzi Island. We worked with the Funzi Turtle Club, and they wanted money to build a conservation and ecotourism center, and that's, you see it right there, in exchange for replanting some uh, destroyed mangrove forests and husbanding the, uh, the turtles there. So I'd like to, uh, to end with two lessons here. One is nev when you have an idea, never ever just give up on it and assume, oh, this is crazy, or if it's a good idea, it's already done. Just take the example uh, in Falia Lupo Samoa. One idea to trade a tangible improvement, such as a kindergarten or freshwater delivery system, for a marine or forest reserve. That one idea has now led to projects in 46 countries around the world uh, protecting not one but two million acres of uh, threatened uh, forest and, mar and marine ecosystems. And the last lesson I will, I will bring again to you, very important too, is if you see an elephant coming down the beach to take a swim, <laughs> get in the water first. Thank you very much. <laughs>